Hello, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I want to thank uh, Axis for inviting me to give this talk on heart health in people with 47XXY. And I've, you know, titled the talk focused on 47XXY just because we know that there's a, a lot more information about heart health in this population. But uh, I think that you'll see when I give this talk that we are actually, I'm actually gonna be covering um, some very general topics. And so I hope that this will be broadly applicable to all individuals with different X and Y variations, um, as well as probably your family members too. Um, so thank you. And I'll also put in the caveat that um, I'm not actually an expert in this field. I'm not a cardiologist. I don't do research on this, um, but I think that as a, a general uh, physician and someone who is interested in advocating uh, for the health and well-being of our patients, um, this is a topic that is um, uh, important to me. So I just want to cover what I'm going to talk about today. The first topic um, is to discuss the heart health concerns for children and adults with 47XXY or Kleinfelder syndrome. The second topic is to discuss this important um, idea of metabolic syndrome and why it is important for heart health. And then finally, we're going to talk about things that you can do to prevent heart health problems. So the first topic, um, I just want to talk briefly about heart health in infants and kids with 47XXY. Um, in general, we think that babies with 47XXY are not at significantly increased risk for congenital heart disease, that is a, a heart problem that you're born with, um, compared to the general population. However, it is notable that the rate of congenital heart problems in the general population is relatively high. It's up to 50, up to 5%. And so um, because of this congenital heart disease um, is uh, screened for routinely um, and is typically detected by that routine screening in pregnant women and their infants. And so sometimes we see that 47XXY is diagnosed because a baby or a child has genetic testing to look for a genetic cause of their congenital heart defect. Um, and so certainly um, we have in our clinic individuals with 47XXY who have congenital heart disease, but we don't necessarily think that there's a causative link. There may just be, it may just be coincidence in the fact that both these are two relatively common things that happen to be occurring together. Um, the, so if you, if you don't have a congenital heart defect, um, then really the bigger thing to focus on in terms of heart health um, are these common heart problems that can occur um, uh, in adulthood typically. And so we know there's a lot of evidence that adults with 47XXY are at increased risk for common age-related heart conditions. These include heart attack, stroke, blood clots, and decreased heart function. Um, we don't really understand all the reasons why this is the case, but it's been well documented in a number of studies. We also know that heart disease is the number one cause of death for all adults, including those with 47XXY and other, uh, and, and other uh, X and Y variations. But importantly, we know we can prevent, detect, and treat heart problems in um, people with X and Y variations. So I want to spend some time talking about this concept of metabolic syndrome. So what is metabolic syndrome? This is kind of a buzzword and you might hear it a lot in some of the other talks and your physicians and online. But basically what metabolic syndrome is, is it's a description of a number of different clinical findings. And I've shown them here. There are five findings. The first is increased blood pressure or high blood pressure. The second is high triglycerides which is a high level of fats that circulate in your blood. The second, is, the third is a large waistline. So this is just a, some, uh, if you tend to carry weight more around your, your waist or your abdomen compared to the rest of your body. Sometimes people talk about this as being kind of apple shaped rather than pear shaped. The fourth is um, low levels of HDL cholesterol. So HDL cholesterol is our good cholesterol it preve helps prevent heart disease. And so you want to have high levels, not low levels of this HDL cholesterol. And then the final finding is elevated fasting blood sugar. This is a finding that can indicate risk for diabetes. It can sometimes be, be um, uh, 
also called like pre-diabetes. So we know that these findings, either alone or in combination, can increase your risk of these common adult onset heart diseases that I um, mentioned in the other slide. And if you have three or more of these findings together, um, that can be defined as metabolic syndrome. We know that the rate of metabolic syndrome in people with 47XXY is estimated to be about five times higher than that of the general population. And that's really why this is an important topic to discuss um, for patients with 47XXY. Um, I mentioned that high blood sugar can be prediabetes, can be a sign of prediabetes. And so it's important to also talk about type 2 diabetes. We know that type 2 diabetes affects um, a large portion of adults with 47XXY. The studies are variable, but it estimates are anywhere between 10 and 39% um, of adults with 47XXY will have diabetes. Um, this risk is estimated to be about four times that of the general population. We also know that men with 47XXY are more likely to develop diabetes at a younger age and at a lower body mass index. So body mass index is basically a ratio of your weight to your height. So we know that both age, older age, and heavier weights are risk factors for type 2 diabetes. But um, if you have 47XXY, you don't necessarily need to have those additional risk factors as well. And we know that diabetes in men with 47XXY has been associated with higher mortality risk. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, the, I, I want to talk a little bit about the potential mechanisms for metabolic syndrome in 47XXY. So um, first of all, I'll say that we don't really fully understand this, but there are some observations that we can make. First of all, we know that there are overall changes in body composition in individuals with 47XXY. They tend to have more truncal or abdominal fat. Um, and this is true even for people who, have, who are at normal weights or have normal body mass indexes. Um, there's a lot of speculation about what the role of low testosterone is or hypogonadism um, in this process. Um, but overall, we think that the increased rate of metabolic syndrome is, can't be fully explained by untreated hypogonadism alone. And there are a few reasons for this. First of all, we know that the features of metabolic syndrome actually start before puberty in individuals with 47XXY. So 80% of prepubertal boys with 47XXY will have at least one of those features of metabolic syndrome that I discussed on the previous slide. Um, there has been uh, one nice study um, uh, by Shanley Davis and, and her colleagues that looked, uh, did this randomized study looking at oxandrolone, which is a type of testosterone treatment in prepubertal boys to see how it affected some of these features of metabolic syndrome. And they showed that it reduced body fat, which is good, um, but that it also seems to decrease HDL or good cholesterol levels. So it was a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of the effect. Um, and then finally, if we look at adults, there have been observational studies in adults that have failed to show a correlation between testosterone replacement therapy and the rates of diabetes in men with 47XXY. Um, so it's not simply that we can treat this by replacing testosterone or, uh, um, alone. Um, I think it's important to point out socioeconomic factors. Um, we know that lower educational attainment and lower income can influence lifestyle factors in the general population. So these are things like diet and exercise, which will influence your risk for heart disease. And we know that individuals with 47XXY overall, on average, can sometimes have lower educational attainment and income levels compared to the rest of the population. So that may be playing a role. So finally, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about how you can prevent heart health problems. The first thing to point out is that prevention can start really early. Um, and so if you are a parent of an infant or a young child with 47XXY, um, just think that right now you have, this is kind of a golden opportunity. 
um, because we know that the first five years of life are really critical for developing healthy habits that will influence your health for the rest of your life. And so this is a hot topic in, in pediatrics. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, you know, how do you encourage healthy eating habits in your kids? How do you encourage physical activity? How do you get them to sleep well <laughs> and then typically? Um, and how do you reduce screen time? So uh, I recommend this website, healthychildren.org. Um, it is uh, um, put together by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it has a whole slew of different really helpful uh, advice on uh, what you can do if you have uh, you know, to in encourage um, good healthy habits in your children. And so, um, you know, they have tools there so you can plug in, well, I have an infant, what should I do? Um, or I have a really picky toddler who won't eat anything I put in front of him, what should I do? Um, and so I think it's a, it's a nice website. Um, but it's also important to point out that prevention is lifelong. And um, we know that um, there are many studies in the general adult population that show that lifestyle changes have been proven to improve the findings of metabolic syndrome and the risk for heart disease. And so these are kind of the pinnacles and the most important things to think about are healthy eating choices, staying active, losing weight, and not smoking. Um, and and you know, I think that these are all goals that we um, would love to work on, uh, you know, but it's also okay to set reasonable expectations for yourself. Even minor improvements in, in these findings can make an impact in health. So even uh, losing a small amount of weight, for example, has been shown to decrease the risk of um, uh, diabetes and to actually even reverse findings of type 2 diabetes. It's also important to visit your doctor regularly. You should have a physical exam, have your blood pressure checked, do screening blood work, check what your cholesterol level is, check what your fasting blood sugar is. Um, and if you are prescribed medications, um, to take them as prescribed. Finally, I think it's important to address any behavioral or mental health concerns. Um, and you know, we know certainly that for many people, behavioral and mental health concerns can be a major barrier to establishing good um, lifestyle changes. And so uh, this really needs to be part of the conversation uh, that you have with your physician um, and uh, making sure that that's taken care of first. So there are a few uh, resources that are out there um, for working on lifestyle to reduce the risk of heart disease. So first of all, I think it's important to ask your physician. Ask um, your physician has uh, often has the best access to resources that may be available within your community um, that may be covered by your health insurance um, and uh, um, any local clinics, et cetera. So always start with your physician, that's a good idea. But there is a dizzying amount of information out there um, on how to improve your overall health. And uh, so there's a lot of information online. Um, I've, uh, not all of it's good, <laughs> which is true for most medical information, but some online resources that are good and helpful, I've listed here. Um, the National Diabetes Prevention Program um, has a nice website. This is a program that's run by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and uh, um, they have a lot of links to great resources. Um, and the American Heart Association also um, has a lot of good information. Um, and then finally, uh, we all love technology. And I think that um, there are many ways that we can use technology to our advantage um, when uh, trying to work on improving lifestyle. So there are a lot of cell phone apps you can do to track what you're eating. Um, and then of course, there are, are things like Fitbits uh, to track your exercise and activity levels. And I think that those can be um, uh, really motivating for certain people. I just wanna end by uh, talking a little bit about uh, what we can do in the future. So 
Um, you know, I, I mentioned that there's actually a lot of things we don't understand about why people with 47XXY have, um, have this increased risk for heart disease. And so I hope that we are working on fostering collaborations, which will allow us to do large scale clinical trials to unravel the roles of hormones versus genetic factors in the development of heart disease in people with 47XXY. And ultimately, we'd like to be able to generate evidence-based guidelines for screening and treatment of metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes and heart disease in people with 47XXY. Everything that I discussed today um, really are um, empiric approaches based on what we know are helpful for the general population. But it would be nice to be able to come up with some targeted screening and treatment guidelines for individuals with X and Y variations um, uh, specifically. And finally, I would just like to acknowledge um, my colleagues in the MGH Kleinfelder Syndrome Clinic. Dr. Francis Hayes is a reproductive endocrinologist who runs the clinic with me. Um, and she provided a lot of the uh, materials that were, went into the slides for today's talk. Um, Ashley Wong is our genetic counselor who does really wonderful things for our patients. Emma Snyder is the, the original clinic coordinator for our clinic when we first started up. Uh, she has now moved on to graduate program in genetic counseling. And we're really pleased this summer to be introducing Eleanor Simone to our team um, as our new clinic coordinator. And finally, just a little uh, historical note um, uh, about Massachusetts General Hospital. So Dr. Harry Kleinfelder himself uh, uh, was at MGH in the 1940s when he originally described this syndrome. And so there is a history of uh, uh, seeing and treating patients with Kleinfelder syndrome or 47XXY at MGH. And we're just happy to be able to continue that legacy by establishing the clinic here. Thanks so much for your attention. <laughs>